What does the pufferfish tell us about junk DNA and dark matter? A great moment from Dr. Jeffrey Bland on the Functional Forum. Basically, the human genome in its entirety is huge compared to any other genome. It, it dwarf, uh, the, 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 it makes the uh, chimpanzee genome look uh, just tiny in comparison. And so all this other stuff that's in there, all this other DNA that's in there has been a question mark for some time. People knew it was in there. But because it didn't code for protein through normal mRNA transcription, people said, well, OK, what are we going to call it? Let's just call it junk, because it must be remnants. There's a lot of repeating units in there and a lot of, of redundancy. And so it must be stuff that's not that important. So we're just going to call it junk. But I, I want to really remind us that I know I'm giving you a quick reminder of maybe some things you prefer to forget, but in the, in, the, in the biology of the gene, the molecular biology of the gene, remember that there are these uh, spacers in the, in the genes, um, and these are the introns, right? And those have to be pulled out in, in the splicing to get rise to give rise into the, uh, the genome that's going to do the, or the portion of the gene that's going to do the coding for the protein. So we assumed for a long time that these, uh, these green spots in there were uh, kind of like just who knows what. They were like insulators or something, and they, they weren't providing any function. Now, uh, as I'll go through, we recognize that they code for all sorts of information pertaining to the regulation of how genes are expressed as families. And we don't express genes one at a time. You know, you, you, you have these, these families, and that's what really differentiates humans from others is the complexity of how you uh, assemble and express these in, in groups. So if I asked a simple question, a kind of a um, uh, statistical question, how many permutations and combinations could you have of 22,000 genes take multiple at a time? Ha ha. Now we get into an infinite number of virtually of, of possibilities, right? And so that's the diversity of the human species. The more way they can be assembled intelligently, the more diversity and control and fine structure you have. So the puffer fish is an interest. I actually studied tetrodotoxin in the puffer fish. I was doing neuroscience at one of my phases in my earlier life. And um, it turns out the puffer fish genome is kind of interesting because it has 98% of its DNA. It codes for protein. Uh, and so it's very efficient. But it doesn't have much executive centers of what used to be called junk DNA. So exactly the reverse of the human genome that's only 2% coding and 98% other stuff. So what is this junk DNA? This, this is a wonderful book, by the way. Um, Nessa Carey is a really wonderful writer. She's a, a molecular geneticist in, in England. And so she talks about the fact that this junk DNA can, contains within it the promoter regions of genes, the long sequence uh, uh, non-coding RNAs, uh, telomeres, which we're going to talk about in a moment, uh, short inhibitory RNAs, and microRNAs. So they're all coded for out of the non-protein coding portion of what used to be called junk DNA. Okay, so uh, as uh, Nessa said in, in the, the Junk DNA book, I quote, one shock from the sequencing of the human genome was a realization that the extraordinary complexities of human anatomy, physiology, intelligence, and behavior cannot be explained by referring to the classical model of the genes. Wow, that's a pretty compelling statement, isn't it? When we think of all the time we spent putting this stuff to memory, thinking that we had answers that we could reproduce on demand and it would be of value. Now we're saying, well, maybe it's only of limited value, that we need to be looking farther down the story. And so you look at the ENCODE project. I don't know how many of you have followed this, but the ENCODE project is very fascinating because it started looking at the full complex of information encoded in the genes, not just the coding portion for protein. And they, uh, the first published paper out of the ENCODE project uh, was, in 19, uh, was in 2007, excuse me, in which they um, were able to do a complete uh, decoding of only 2% of the human genome. But in that 2%, they found all these regions that, of non-coding uh, portions of the genome that had functional characteristics, right? Fun and I, I love this term because functional genomics has emerged now as the frontier of this genomic space. So if we, uh, genes can't change, but their expression does, then the dark matter of the genome is what controls the expression of genes. So if you look at that you know, kind of mass of DNA sitting in there, that's obviously not ready to, to sell to divide. That's just kind of a distributed DNA. There's a huge amount of that, 98%, that's related to regulation of how the message is going to be expressed under different environmental circumstances. Thanks so much for watching. And for more great clips like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
I've created a special free video just for you. It's called the five steps to becoming a leader in your wellness community. And it'll give you some of the starting points on how to position yourself as the leader in your zip code of your health community. All you have to do is click on the link below.